So everybody out there listening in, um, please put questions in the chat box and I will read them uh, out loud. And um, so we're supposed to have Israel Holloway, who is a watercolorist. Um, he's supposed to be here and he has no excuse like uh, I'm on the wrong time zone because he's in Colorado. So uh, we'll see. <laughs> We'll see if he shows up or not. Um, but we do have Nancy Bass um, uh, from the East Coast and brand new to the show this year. Super excited to have your work in the show. And Neil Sherman. Neil, is this your fourth year? Fifth? I think it's four. Yeah. Five. Yeah. So Neil um, uh, from um, the very cold, cold upper um wisconsin area minnesota well it's all the same up there right it's just a big white door <laughs> <laughs> okay sorry oh, okay i get it's a difference um okay from minnesota um and, and so um this is going to be really fun because neil you, your work, um, here you are in a Western show. Um, you're creating work that is really based on Northern Minnesota, um, but it really, I have to say, resonates with my audience. Um, and, and so I love what you're bringing to this work. And um, uh, so um, I am going to screen share when we get to each of you, and we're going to talk about each piece individually. Um, and the Nancy, new to the show, um, and your work, I was just uh, taking a tour around this morning, and we stopped in front of your work, and I said, I love when an artist makes me laugh. And, uh, and, and I think my, my big comment was, you had me at Edward Hopper. So. <laughs> So you're about to find out what this is. Um, okay, so let's start, Neil. Let's start with you. And um, Neil, I, you know, would you, I'm, I think I think what is just really so um, wonderful for people to know about your work right off the bat is to talk about where you are, the climate, um, and, and to talk about. Um, how that affects your work and how that plays into the work you're creating. Yeah. Well, I was, I was thinking about what you were commenting before, how the Minnesota scenes resonate with, uh, you know, the Western um, market, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it kind of boils down to like, um, there's a lot of similarities, uh, you know, between Colorado and Minnesota, other than elevation, which is the huge difference, of course. But I mean, the area where I live is northern Minnesota. And you are right today. It's a winter blur. We got like 15 inches of snow. Wow. last night, And it's about five degrees. And there's about a 30 mile an hour wind today. Oh so it's definitely, <laughs> definitely winter here today. Um, but there are, there's just uh, where I live, it's right on the edge of the um, wilderness. And there's a lot of areas that are just similar to Colorado where you're off the grid and out in nature and it's just you in the wilderness. Yeah. And um, so uh, I think the similarity there. So um, do you, let me see. I think last time we talked, uh, do you have running water? Uh, no. I have electricity <laughs> and a good yeah. wood stove, but I'm off. I'm sort of semi-primitive living. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So for those of you who are watching this, uh, Neil's the real deal. What you're seeing, this is, this is a made up. This is really, I mean, there's artistic license, of course, but yeah, this is, this is Neil Sherman. You're, you're meeting Neil. I think what, um, you know, the, I've been thinking about the paintings I sent in this year and just sort of the, some of the themes that were in there. And I think what the area where I live that affects me in terms of painting is it's just ruggedness. Yeah. And I, I kind of like that. I kind of like being, you know, in a, maybe not necessarily in a situation where I'm um, faced with some adversity in terms of like bad weather or something, but I just like being like today, it was just super windy and it kind of felt good just to stand out in the wind and kind of feel it running over you and 
Yeah. Uh, okay. So people, when I say artists are kind of nuts, that there, there it is right there. <laughs> it, it felt good to stand in the wind <laughs> in northern Minnesota. Yeah. And you don't have, I mean, as a landscape painter, I really don't have much choice. Mm -hmm. um, it's either bear, you know, gear up and paint in the elements as best you can, or just kind of be locked in the studio all yeah. for the next six months. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, I'm pulling up your images for the show and yes. I'm just, I'm just making a beeline to the wolf moon. Let's talk about this piece yeah. and um, and and tell us about this. This is uh, is um, this is a uh, gentleman near you who has um, huskies. Does he? Do yeah. Uh -huh. So it's a uh, he doesn't. So the friend of mine. Um, this is a local um, resort lake, and my friend he doesn't do it anymore, but he used to. Um, during the winter time, he would offer dog sled rides for the guests of the lodge. And he would set up a teepee out on the lake as sort of a warming house for the, get, the for the guests. And um, I had a, fr a friend of mine was helping him with the mushing and he invited me out one time and it was just a great, a great scene all around, just all kinds of different, you know, he had his dogs um, staked out on the ice. And of course he had that beautiful teepee and so it's been kind of a recurring uh, theme. I think I had, I've had a couple of mm -hmm. um, teepee. I think last year I had a nice dog sled scene with the teepee in it. And yeah. I just keep coming back to that. I just, I don't know, there's, I can't really speak to what it is. Maybe it's just sort of the primitive nature, again, being out, at, out in the kind of the wilderness. But yeah. um, I will say there's a little bit of like, oh, this might be a, something that would appeal to the Western crowd a little bit, but mm -hmm. I don't come at it with that fully intention in mind to just come at it from a scene that I just enjoy and want to explore different, different. You know, and that's really key. It is, and I think this is the, a, a difficult thing when you're painting um, one on a deadline, but two for a show that has a theme. And our show is the Coors Western Art Exhibit and Sale. Um, as, as artists know, um, I, our niche with this show um, has from, from when I started been to really look at life today, not, not look back um, at historic work or Remington and Russell, but you know, wonderful um, work, but to really talk about uh, what it is like to live in the West and live in nature. And I think something that your work really captures um, in my mind is, uh, is a very Western way of thinking of um, how rugged it is out here at times as well. And certainly as we're, we could use some of your snow, we're in a <laughs> serious drought, um, and, you know, and so how, how we are, um, um, at the mercy of the elements as well. And so I think, I think for me, there is that kind of bridge with your work um, and, and that thought um, that connects you and your painting with the West. And so, you know, this painting, um, I know when you're seeing it on a screen, it, it's hard to um, get all the intricacies of it. Um, in person, it is just magical, this night scene. Would you talk about developing that um, night sensibility? Yeah, so I've always kind of enjoyed painting at night. Um, there's just a certain quality about it that I think is appealing. Again, maybe kind of rugged, mm -hmm. simple, nothing fancy. It's just all about, you know, silhouette shapes, really, and, and a light source. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing I've been doing recently and sort of, display that in last year's exhibit um, is taking scenes and then creating the light effect from memory. And so that this painting is actually um, pretty much fabricated just from uh, memory with the exception of the teepee, which I have so you know painting reference for. Um, but I just made up the light effect. I did a, actually a little uh, six months ago or so I did a, I did a little teeny study of it. Yeah. And then I thought it'd make a nice, a um, little bit larger one. I think this is a 16 by 20 inch painting. Yeah. And um, so I just sort of, 
I just kind of think, oh, it would be a really cool light effect, or maybe I have a, um, when I'm working from memory, and maybe I'll take a, a daylight scene and then just try to recreate it as a night, oh. night scene. Um, yeah. So this painting is kind of just like, oh, it'd be really cool to do, uh, you know, a bright moon painting um, at night and just kind of focus on the teepee and have a little color in there. Yeah. I know that, you know, in real in reality, you probably wouldn't see that much color. Um, it might not even be that bright, but I just, I just, you know, it's just appealing. And it's fun to play with that contrast of light and shadow. For sure, yeah. Here's another one. Let's just stay on these. Okay, so winterized is an eight by ten, um, and and this one too. These are just such little gems. And you're, you know, speaking of that, just really, you know, how much can you really see in this kind of weather condition? And yeah. um, you know, in this painting and all your paintings you know, really, really meant to see in person because they're so subtle. And this is another one that is really, all the tonality is so tight with it. Yeah, this painting, I remember this was two, two winters ago, I think, and the, there was a hoarfrost. And so everything was covered in frost. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of a, you know, it's kind of an exercise in painting white on white on white. And how do you delineate the differences there? This is this particular scene. Uh, every year, there's a group of painters that come up to northern Minnesota, and we spend a week um, at a YMCA camp, kind of on the on a edge of the wilderness on a lake, and we paint for a week. And so this is one of their um, buildings. I think it's their sauna building. Um, but I just like this the silhouette of it and it sort of reminded me of some of the Russian painter themes oh yeah kind of that old log house and strong silhouette shape and just real you know you know a lot of brush strokes um the challenge in this painting was trying to paint all of those trees in front of the building oh, yeah. and get a sense that there was you know air like you could see through the wispy branches on the top but not make it too heavy that it looked clunky and then trying to get to the branches. So the, getting that layering was sort of the challenge. Yeah. You know, I think this is, it's probably like, uh, so, so this quote is, has been attributed to many writers, but, uh, um, but I think Mark Twain is one of them that uh, has said, I uh, apologize for the length of this letter. I would have made it shorter if I had more time. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I, and I think just like creating these, um, paintings that appear so simplified and effortless is, is just really, you know, can be a real trial, um, yeah. you know, to, to, because you're capturing almost a haiku or just this really small tone poem in this work. You, you can't put everything in it, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing I've been kind of focusing more on lately in my painting too, is just how much can I say with little? Mm -hmm. And what's really essential for um, communicating that scene in front of me. And um, yeah, the one thing I was looking at these paintings, this is kind of a, an oddball tangent, but I was looking at this painting and then there's another winter painting of the same scene. Oh. Um, that what I thought was interesting was it's the um, wildly still. Yeah. It's the same scene, just painted in winter. Oh, nice. But so if you look in this painting on the far right hand side, there's a tree that looks like it's got a big black blob on the top. Is it a bird? It looks like a bird. No, it's just like a cluster of yeah. pine cones or something. Oh, wow. But when I was looking at these, this painting and the green painting that you had up before, I noticed that I included that same little cluster oh, in okay. the painting. And I don't know why. It's just such an odd thing to do. Because I normally don't look for stuff I had to add. And I just don't know what, oh so my kind of on, the, on the quarter side of the, of the right hand yeah. of this one, you can see right that here. there. So I don't know, interesting, just, it was just curious to me why I made that little note. But, You're making me think I have to rehang your, your wall now. Oh no. <laughs> no, that's a great, that's really fun to know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and are you painting those out on location? Those, these small? Yeah. Yeah, this is a studio piece, this next one. 
uh, winter uh, remains. Yeah. Yeah, this one's just really so gorgeous. Yeah, this is another place I've come back to frequently to paint. It's a uh, so uh, along Lake Superior where I live on the North Shore. There's a history of commercial fishing, mm -hmm. where fishermen would go out and fish for lake trout and herring. And there used to be this used to be an old fish shack, and there's a, there were a number of those along the shore, um, up and down from Duluth to to Canada. And the commercial fishing is pretty much non-existent. So all these little mm. cabin or these little fish huts where fishermen would process their catch or store their boats are kind of being reclaimed by the lake. So this one's close to where I live. I've done a, different paintings of it at various times a year. And this one just, um, this particular scene, again, started off as a, as a smaller eight by 10 that I did on location and then um, made it into a studio piece. You know, I, I just, I love this about your work. Every year when it comes in, I feel the weather in your work. Yeah. Uh, it's it, just such a, it's such a, like a, in writing, they call it, a, it's the weather can be a character. Yeah. You know, and yours is a, is a definite character in your work. Um, I, would say I don't necessarily look like if I'm painting a scene, I don't think about, oh, I need to capture the weather per se, but Sometimes it's just integral to the, to yeah. the seasons, whatever the weather was that day or. Right. You know. um, Swamper Creek flowage. Yeah, my new favorite oh. spot to paint it. Oh, really? Yeah. So, okay, this is fun to also see it blown up this big on the screen because you can see the brush strokes in this painting yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this painting, I really, so this particular scene, I had no idea it existed until somebody <laughs> Um, was telling me where to find blueberries this summer. Um, oh. And I went out looking and didn't find any blueberries, but I found this scene to paint in. Wow. Um, that is just really, I don't know what it is about my paintings and dead trees, but I really just like, I kind of like that. Again, it's that rugged persistence, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, standing up to nature. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, and the silhouette shapes of all those trees. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so uh, go nowhere. Um, hey, Gregory Mays, um, would you just shut off your video? Would you mind doing that too? Um, okay. I'm going to take the spotlight off of um, Neil and we're going to head over to Nancy. Um, I'm going to put the spotlight on you. And so much fun. Okay. So Neil, go nowhere. We're coming back to you. Nancy, how are you? So, so your first year in the show. Uh, I, I can't believe it. I mean, I just couldn't believe it that I got in. It's really exciting. You know, it's so funny because um, we get a lot of artists applying for the show. I always tell people this and uh, the show is not juried every year. It, like a lot, there are not a lot of shows out there. Um, in fact, there's one that I am a um, naughty juror for. I was supposed to make my selections by yesterday and have not. Um, but uh, there are a lot of shows that are completely juried, which means all the work is, is um, and all the artists, there might be some that are in every year, but all the work, it's just brand new. It's a clean slate. The core show, we work more like a gallery. Um, so I have a stable of artists who um, come back year after year, and, um, and but we always have room to fit in artists. So usually from artists who apply, like Nancy did, I'll take three, maybe four artists out of, and it could be upwards of 400 plus who apply to the show. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're on because I'm also just you have to tell me about this work and where this work has come from. Um, but let's, but let's start, if you don't mind, would you please talk about your background and um, you are, you are from the Carolinas? Well, um, I was born in the Midwest in Illinois um, and um, I, I spent my first 20 years there. And then when I, I got married young and um, my husband and I moved to Virginia oh. and we bought a farm 
and we started raising cattle. Um, I had studied art in college and um, my teachers had encouraged me to be a portrait artist. So I had started doing children's portraits. Um, but anyway, we moved out to Virginia and we started farming and uh, we bought our, some cattle, black Angus, and we had a Hereford bull. And um, I decided I would learn, teach myself to paint landscape. And, um, and so I did, and I would have these little cows in the background and it was kind of your typical landscape. But over time, the cows were getting bigger and bigger in my paintings. <laughs> and I kind of went back to portrait. They became these portraits. And um, I realized that was, you know, I just couldn't not do the portraits of the cow. So for years I've been painting um, these little paintings of portraits of my cows and we had a herd and they were named and um, we had all different varieties, all different breeds. And it wasn't about cows to eat. It was about cows to paint really. Uh, uh, and, <laughs> yeah, that's so, not uh, how it generally works. No, it's not how yeah. it works. But we would go to a cattle show and I would pick a cow based on how pretty she was her face or whatever <laughs> not on how good a breeder I mean I just didn't care about that I love um, it so we had a beautiful herd of cows and um it just was a magical life and they inspired my painting it just really changed and um so as time went on and I was doing these paintings I just I didn't want to I wanted to find new ways of um painting that cattle that hadn't been done that I, I wouldn't bore myself with something different. And so um, yeah. originally I started painting them with um, abstract backgrounds. They were like color field. So it was in college, you know, you had studied color field painting and you never would put in anything realistic. So I thought, well, you know, I'm an artist. I can do anything I wanted. So I would juxtapose these cows in front of color fields and, um, it just, it was, it just took off. I mean, I just did really well with that. And I did that for a long time until I kind of got tired of doing those. And um, my favorite thing to do is for a vacation is to go to a city and go to an art museum. So um, when I was a child, we would go up to the um, Chicago Institute of Art that was in just, you know, that we, we would just do that. And so our, uh, art has always been really important to me and I've had favorite artists and um, like Warhol, obviously, and right, Tebow, right. And, oh, just so many. Um, so I, I don't know how I came up with this idea, but um, I decided I was gonna have my cows, we're gonna go to the museum. And <laughs> so I've been working on the, this series of paintings for a few years and, um, I don't know, they've done really well. They've won awards and um, I'm still working on them. I have plans for more. Mm -hmm. um, the tricky thing about this isn't replicating the painting so much. Right. It's, it's finding the right cow for the painting. So, okay, let's talk about that. How is this the right cow for uh, Warhol? What, what, what made this cow just be totally like, I'm hanging out in front of, uh, of Andy? Um, what would, I, I think it was, you know, I, I have files and files that I took over the years of my cow. So I go through them and, um, I think the black, um, with the outlining of the Marilyn mm -hmm. seemed to me to work and something about obviously the frontalness of Marilyn and the frontalness of the cow, the direct gaze engaging you. Um, and the fact that I could weave the gold into the black um, and some of the other colors. Whereas like if I had taken a white cow, it would have dominated, I thought. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's trying to find the right cow. And so I do studies on paper. I just oil painting on papers and try a few different things until I figure out what I wanna do. And I don't worry about whether the scale is right between the cow and the painting. I just don't think that's really important. It's just conveying the idea that this cow is actually a 
sentient being in this museum. And um, it, it's just, uh, you know, to engage with the viewer and this multiple layers of um, you, you're the viewer looking at the cow, the cow's looking at you, you're looking at your painting, you're in a museum, um, just, just kind of um, the unexpected. Right. Um, Right. Yeah, of course. I mean, the scale, it's, I mean, obviously there's not a cow in a museum um, standing in front of a Hopper painting. Okay. Um, um, A curator friend of mine and a collector was, uh, they walked through last week and we were standing in front of this and we were all trying to figure out where is this Hopper painting? Which museum is this one in? I I think this is at the Yale Museum of Art. That, that's what I'm pretty yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is my favorite thing to say. You had me at Hopper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know what? Maybe like, I also love, I love art that makes me laugh and um, is, is just really this fun little wink to art history and, um, you know, American artist and uh, talk, so talk about this painting, talk about, you know, and I, I just kind of wonder if quite honestly, would Hopper find this amusing because I think he was kind of curmudgeon but uh, talk about this painting, talk about how this one came together. Um, well, actually my daughter is an art historian at Yale. Uh, so I think she had proposed this one for me when we were walking through the museum. Um, nice. And uh, so we were looking at it and um, I, of course, you know, I love Hopper and this one worked particularly well because um, he didn't have his wife painted in this one. I didn't want people really, mm-hmm. um, but I like the light and, and the, that again, it's multiple layers because you're going into his space, you go into a room, you go out into the, you see the, the water yeah. um, and it was tricky then to find the right cow with the right lighting that looked like it could actually maybe be part of this painting. Um, So, you know, again, that, that is the tricky part. Um, And then figuring out what scale I want to use to make it work. Um, But yeah, and trying to get the mood. So the way I would feel about a painting and the mood of it and the cow that would have kind of the right mood for the painting. Um, yeah. So it looked like it belonged together. It, like, it just didn't, um, they didn't clash. Um, they could work together. And so that was really what I was after. And then it's just a joy to paint these. I mean, yeah. because you're, you're reliving this, these paintings, you get to know them better and you appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just, it's a, it's a, just a joyous thing to do. Oh. It, sometimes it's hard, but it's, it's been really fun. Well, I think that that sense comes through with the work for sure. And, you know, I love like looking at this painting and the light coming in and that hard angle that Hopper did in his painting and how it shines on the cow is if like, where do the, where does the painting end and the cow begin? And it's really fun. These paintings are so much fun. Okay. So I'm going to pull up the Liechtenstein. Mm-hmm. Um, and this one, so why, Brad, darling, this painting is a masterpiece. <laughs> Bye, soon you'll have all of New York clamoring for your work. Um, oh my gosh. And this like little inquisitive uh, cow, calf standing right there is just hilarious. Um, how did you pick this particular painting? Well, of course, I love the art reference. You know, I just thought that was too hysterical that Uh, you know, I couldn't use it. I mean, and it had sold, I think in the last few years, this painting sold for like some insane amount, like 130,000 million. I mean, it was like a record breaking painting. So um, I had seen it, I think online and after at the, when it had auctioned or something in artsy or something. And um, so when I was looking through his work and I, I, this, it just seemed like the one I wanted to use. and just because of the, the art historical play from what he was saying. And um, even though it had people, you know, I thought it was kind of tricky. I just didn't know if I could make it work. Um, but um, again, I found the right cow, I thought to 
kind of pull it off. And um, mm-hmm. she she was one of my favorite cows. And uh, oh, this was one of yours. Oh yeah, they're all my. We're all our. <laughs> they're all your cows. Right. Oh right. my gosh. Um, um, so we have three little. These are little little six by six paintings, um, and they're just delightful. Um, but these are all your cows as well. I'm guessing, yeah. Yes. Now, sometimes I don't paint my cows now because we don't have a farm. Um, mm. We sold it, and we're it, it, so your husband caught on to what you were doing that. You were buying subject matter and he. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did it for 35 years. So oh, we, wow. finally, we did all the work and he did most of it. And we finally um, decided it was time to slow down. And so um, we, we spend our winters in Florida and we're in the summer, we're in, in, um, in the Asheville area of North Carolina. And we have um, a lot of neighboring farms. So um I've gotten permission to paint some of the cattle on my neighboring farm. So um, I still have all the files for my cattle. I still paint those, but it's nice to have new, fresh things to paint to new animals. Um, Yeah. So. All right. So Israel Holloway, missing in action, but fear not. Come here, my friend. Look who wandered into the gallery this morning, (laughs) David Griffin. So we are sitting in front of his paintings. And so, so this is like a, this is a game day decision, right? This is how I roll. This is punt. Exactly. Well, not no, no, it's audible. It's an audible. Yeah, yeah, it's an audible. (laughs) Um, So, all right. So, um, Neil, Nancy, hang tight. So what I like to do at the end of these talks is have the artists all, if you have questions for each other, I'm going to open up the mics. Those of you out there listening, type in your questions and I'm gonna ask them of the artists. Uh, So because I have David here um, and I've positioned myself in front of his paintings, like literally, so you can't even see them. No, I'm gonna swing the computer around so you can see them and have David talk about it. And um, this particular painting right back here This is the featured art piece. This is what we bought from David. This is going into our permanent collection and this is gonna be posters. So David is still recovering because I made him sign 1300 posters one day. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Slave labor. Going from right-handed to (laughs) left-handed. Exactly. Um, So because you're here, what the heck? Sure. Um, So featured artists, a lot of people always ask, how do you pick the featured artist? And so what we do is um, I give my advisory committee a short list of artists and I tell them why we want, why I think we need to collect that artist. And, you know, um, one, one reason is we're not going to be able to afford that artist next year. So um, let's giddy up and, and get something. And I think David kind of falls in that category too. Um, you've been on the short list for a couple of years. David was the featured artist last year actually, um, which was COVID and we were not in person. And um, so we talked in the committee and we decided that he was kind of getting the short end of the stick. And so we did not have a featured artist last year and we did not collect a painting last year. So there's a little hole in the collection because of that. But um, we came back with this new work. And um, so David, brought three pieces for us to consider and um they were it was actually a dead tie between the work so I got to be the tiebreaker um and I was the tiebreaker for this particular painting and so what I thought would be kind of fun is if you take over and talk about the work okay and um then I'm gonna kind of swing the computer around slowly if you get seasick, just look away. Do you ever hear people do that? They're like, oh, let me show you this. And I'm like, oh. Yeah, well, it's, it is disconcerting. It is yeah. a little disconcerting. Okay, I'm gonna scoot out of the way, but this is the one we got. Um, and so, yeah, tell us about this piece. 
uh, this painting, uh, the title of the painting is Only a Matter of Time. Uh, where I grew up in Lubbock, Texas, uh, the, the landscape is very flat. It's almost uh, unattractive to most people. To me, it's, it, it, it sings of beauty. So in a, in, a, in a landscape, in a culture, in a neighborhood that I grew up in, where the landscape is very, very small, very flat, and the skies are huge, you typically can see storms moving your way from miles away. Uh, I grow, growing up there, I've always heard the, the comment, you know, this is Wednesday, but you can see Friday coming from the West. So only a matter of time is only a matter of time before the rain gets here, basically is what the, the main context is. You're just seeing these storms form from, a, from miles away. You hear the rolling thunder. You hear, you see the, the cloud begin to expand, the lightning and the, the thunderstorm and the noise. So that's basically what we're talking about here. But it, there's, it, there's a metaphor too. Uh, titles are very important to me. And so being able to emphasize a word in a title kind of takes on a different context, only a matter of time, only a matter of time. Uh, meaning that there's more to it than just maybe just the image that you're looking at. Uh, the narrative is such that maybe it lends itself to being able to expand the, the story the viewer can anyway, uh, or hopefully would, uh, as he becomes more acquainted with the painting. Now, something that I really loved about this painting, you were talking about this light phenomenon that happens when lightning strikes and how it flashes in, in, in the foreground and you capture that. And I'm so mesmerized, right? Would you explain that? Well, there's, and I'm certainly not a scientist or a meteorologist of any sort, but having witnessed these things, uh, these paintings that I'm doing right now are uh, uh, for the most part out of my memory. They're not a specific location necessarily. They're more of an event, a moment. So yes, that when lightning, the manifestation of lightning and the sound, there's a, there is a point where there's an ionization as I understand this, that the, the air is clear, cleared, maybe in clouds kind of separate, things move. There's, it's a mo there's a lot of movement, but the light on the ground is, is a, is, was what I, what I was really trying to capture here is a lead in, a path toward the, the hero, if you will. So that's, that's one way that the light manifests itself is on the ground as well as in the sky. Uh, but there's also a, a phenomenon that, that, that the air is actually uh, filtered or cleared because of the lightning strikes, because of the, the manifestation of the thunderstorm. Uh, now I've told you all I know about, <laughs> about bad weather. I've witnessed this a lot. I've witnessed tornadoes, I've been in tornadoes. But, but this, is a, this is a little more pleasant uh, yeah. point of view. Yeah. Uh, hey, so, okay, I'm gonna swing around to, this was another painting that you brought us to consider. And I'm gonna swing around and you and I can get up okay. and walk over to this one. Okay. Um, but yeah, go ahead and toss that out of the way. Um, so this one here, so, this, this painting, um, not surprisingly, a lot of my, let me tilt this a little bit, uh, a lot of my committee members like this. And it was, it, it's interesting because often there's a piece that people want to take home with them. And so the conversation is then what's going to make the most dramatic uh, poster. So every year we create a poster of the featured art piece. And we have people who've collected every single year um, and they're available, well, they're available, you know, now, but the kind of the big deal of that is we really try to be a show where you can come in and you can walk away with art. You know, you walk away with a $30 poster. Um, and so the drama of the painting we were just looking at, um, whereas this one, yeah, I want, I just want this one in my bedroom. I just want to look at that in the morning. I want to it just calms me down, right? And, but I think what graphically, getting this to reproduce was just going to be a nightmare, right? Yeah, I, I, well, I can imagine. It's, yeah. We've certainly dealt with printers I have in, mm -hmm. in, in some colors, some images are just, you just never can get close enough to 
the original. Yeah. And I would suspect this would be one of those cases. I think it would be really tough. And so, but talk about this because you also, uh, you and Lorna have a home now also in Cordillera, which is just uh, in the mountains, the Colorado mountains. And so a number of these other paintings we're gonna look at are from there and inspired like this one. Yes. Uh, the, the, we didn't intend to buy a home. We came up here about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, and found a place that was really has a big studio in it. And it, um, it just lent itself to, and the pandemic had kind of forced us to think a little more, um, I don't know, a little bit more looking at the men, the mirror at our, and knowing our ages, what we had, what time we had left. <laughs> So we found this place and, and I'd never experienced winter being from Lubbock or Dallas like this. So when the snow came, it was really easy for me to get out and find subject matter all over the place. This is probably about a hundred yards from my house in Cordillera. Um, it's a Nordic center in the, in the winter. They use it for cross country skiing. Oh, right, right. In the summer, it's a big golf course. But this time of day, I was out walking and just, there's so much to look at and so much to be absorbed. It, it reminds me of that, that uh, in context, it reminds me of a statement in, in Robert Henry's book, The Art Spirit. He talks about a lot of artists walk past 25 paintings looking mm -hmm. for one that's got the fireworks in it. Yeah. yeah. This one stopped me. And uh, so I did some sketches and of course went back and photographed it when I could at the time, same time of day. But the name of the painting is Contentment. And that's basically what I felt when I walked to this spot. I just felt like that was a place I could sit mm -hmm. and stand or stand and just be in the moment. But the moment was lengthened by many moments and by minutes. Yeah. And I just found out it to be found it to be something I really wanted to try to portray. Also, I'm using a lot more abstract images in my paintings. I'm finding those to help me with, oh, with composition line and even some of the drama and some of the narrative so that's this is an example of using a little more abstract uh shapes in a little bigger way to to tell the narrative or just explain the story a little better mm -hmm. all right we're gonna do a little hang on to your hats here we go okay so we've got this trio of smaller paintings um, but I'm also going to I'm just gonna skip over to this was the other one that um, that we were considering this big painting here with the big storm cloud. And, um, you know, David, talk to us about this one as well, because this has that same really interesting weather phenomenon that's happening in it. Yeah, this, this of course, this is not Lubbock. Uh, in Dallas, yeah, I have to drive five hours to paint anything. But in my travels, I've spent a lot of time in New Mexico in the high desert. And, this is really somewhere near that, uh, although it could be the high desert in Colorado just as easily. To explain a little bit further what I was talking about, or at least reiterate what I was talking about earlier about the, the lightning storm. In 2020, of course, we're all afflicted, if you will, at least mentally, <laughs> with the pandemic of being isolated, uh, locked down to be uh, living with yourself within four walls. And uh, this painting I started in April of this past, this past spring in 2021. And I just felt like that it, it, at some point that I had begun to understand that, that, that times were changing. Maybe we're getting back to somewhat normal. Mm -hmm. This is again, the, uh, the title of this painting is Clearing the Air. Uh, and it is a metaphor for the for coming out of the pandemic, as well as a, a narrative about about thunderstorms in general. Yeah. Again, the, the clearing air comes happens when the when the lightning strikes or the thunderstorm begins, and the sound and the noise and the clearing the lightning actually the phenomenon is it clears the air. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what what I the germ of that of this painting came from that idea and I just expanded it. And as I talk about it, as I look at it again, I, I remind, I'm reminded of where I was when I started this painting and the feeling I had about trying to say something more than just a pretty picture, say something a little bit more about what was happening to me. Mm -hmm. 
because basically, as all artists know, as Neil and as Israel and, and others know, these paintings are self-portraits. They're, they're where you, it's impossible for us to create something and leave our heart or our soul or our, or our emotions out of it. So there was a lot of emotional um, and, and liberation for me too. But these are all somewhat self-portraits at different points of the day and my life. You know, and I think that's such a, it's such a really important point to make. And I think artists kind of make that point to, to different degrees um, if, as to what you're comfortable in saying, because to somebody just walking out to it, they're like a self portrait, where are you in this? I don't see your face in this. But, it, but when you get that close to the work and you reveal that much of yourself, it is a self portrait, even if it's a landscape or a cow in a museum sure. or a, you know, this cold night scene of, you know, your friend's TP and where yeah. the sled dogs are kept, right? It's, you know, you know that so well. And we talked about this and I'm wondering if you would elaborate on it. We talked about your progression through, this is the 13th year you've been in the show. When you started, you were still transitioning out of being an illustrator. And there were great works um, of uh, your neighbors who happened to be cowboys on the ranch. You grew up in that ranching family and lifestyle. And so you're painting what you knew, but this work now is really, is it 180 or? Yeah, it's got, if you, uh, on a scale, it's yeah. it's about, it's outside of, the, there is dirt involved and there are sky yeah. clouds. It is about as opposite as I could go yeah. in, in my own head. And, and to speak to that, it's so, uh, an artist doesn't need much affirmation. We just need a little bit of a nudge to say, I really understand what you're, I think I understand what you're trying to paint there, or I really like that and I like it because, not because it's just beautiful, it, it touches something inside me. Uh, that's something that I have, I didn't know the byproduct of being put in this show, being juried into the show, being accepted into this show. I didn't know the byproduct, but the byproduct is, is the fact that I have been given permission by the, by, by the culture that Rose has, has, has created in this, this atmosphere, if you will, to be able to do that, to make those, to pivot from one direction into another direction. What I knew was cowboys. My father was, my grandfather was a cowboy. I have his 120 year old saddle in my studio wow. that he used as a working cowboy on the Matador Ranch in the 19, from about 1900 to 1920. So I have that heritage in my spirit. But I knew that there was more to this than what I was at least initially introduced to. There were no artists in my family. I didn't know an artist. I didn't know anything about being an artist. I just knew that there was something about this lifestyle. So it was easy for me to paint those. And we sold them, but I just knew there was something else. But the, the culture that Rose has created helped me have the courage to take the step not just little, and they were little steps, but there were some big steps that I had to, that I took personally to say, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna hope and pray that Rose likes this idea. And she was very, from the first uh, inclination, she was very encouraging. So that helped me understand that I could take these steps and move to, to just strictly landscape. Um, and I, and I, will be eternally grateful for that for the rest of my life because it's hard for, it had been hard for me to find that affirmation of being able to be courageous so um, i attribute where i am today if it's of any merit it's because of rose in this show and the in the culture the art culture in denver in, in general we do have a good we do have a good culture here and we have we have great artists in the show the too is. Yeah, I, you know, and I think so doing these talks has been has been really good because, you know, you can talk about the work and other artists come on and talk about the work and, um, and so speaking of which I'm going to take the spotlight off us and um, and and thank you for saying that too because I do, I do think it is a culture here that 
um, I've tried to foster my advisory committee is so supportive of the artists and, and they want to learn and hear what you're doing and why. And um, it's just, uh, it is a little different kind of show, I think. I, I couldn't agree more, especially the variety and the, 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 the your cur curator, you're a courageous curator <laughs> to, to put all these things that go and make them look seamless and harmonious at the same time. Well, okay, so um, Neil, uh, go ahead and unmute and Nancy. Um, so I would love to know, uh, Neil, Nancy, David, do you have questions for each other um, uh, or comments? And anybody listening in, now we've got Joe Paquette out there uh, who is a wonderful painter from Minnesota um, and good friend Neil Sherman's and uh, finding it hard to believe that Joe doesn't have anything to say. <laughs> yeah, I'm baiting you, Joe, to say something. Uh, what do you want me to say? <laughs> I'll tell you a story about Joe. Oh, okay. Here we go. <laughs> Joe and I, met, we'd met at the show, and, but we, we, we had our second encounter in Barcelona, Spain. Joe, you remember that night of the, of the, of the pole, the dancing stripper pole? <laughs> it was, oh, oh good God, yes. And, yes. and, and, and how we, we sat by, it was the awards banquet in Barcelona at the Meme Museum, M-E-A-M. -E and I sat down by Joe and we got to talk and got reacquainted <laughs> far as I could but I remember the next I saw him the next day and I said Joe did you stay for this what, what happened was this the entertainment after the award show was a a platform dancer and with a stripper pole on it so they were going to have someone come in and perform on this pole for all these art papers right Joe I'm not it was crazy yeah it was unexpected go ahead and elaborate you're part of this because that it was about the <laughs> wildest thing I'd ever seen but anyway Joe Saxley stayed for the show of course he did <laughs> yeah it's all about the art. Yeah, right. <laughs> I remember the next morning I, I saw you or the next day and I said, Joe, what was that like? I said, well, I'll tell you what, I never saw that in Minnesota. Yeah, it doesn't exist. <laughs> We're not in Kansas anymore. No. That's, that's exactly what I said at the show. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh, my God. It's funny. Joe, it's good to see you, by the way. You too. Great to see all of you. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, Neil, of course, is a dear friend uh, way back and and uh, just a variety of the work, you know, Rose, she does, she curates a really wonderfully unique show. The range is, is, uh, is always interesting and curious and uh, engaging, I think. Uh, curious is a good word. That, I mean, I, I definitely, I always tell people um, the, the worst thing you can say um, to me is, oh, that was nice. Like, darn it. <laughs> yeah, not that. <laughs> yeah, not the nice word. Yeah, I love I love people to be uh, stimulated by the show and ask questions and yeah. Um, but Neil, Nancy, do you have any comments or thoughts or anything you want to toss out there? And Nancy, you're on mute, so you have to unmute. Yeah, there you go. Love Zoom. Go ahead. I just think these landscapes from both of you are just gorgeous. They're so subtle and um, I feel the, the, the cold. I feel um, the night. It's just, they're just fabulous. I just, um, I wish I was right there and could see them, um, but they're fantastic. Nancy, I was thinking, I thinking about your paintings today and I was glad Rose mentioned that it was that it made her giggle because I wasn't sure if they were meant to be comical or not. I don't want to make, like I don't want to make a comment like, "Oh, that's really funny," and then have the artist say, "Well, that wasn't my intention." So I'm glad to hear that. But also, like I was thinking about the 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 cows up against the different paintings, and my one thought I had was like, "Well, that's interesting because you know the paintings are all like specific art time periods, like." modernism mm -hmm. and cows really aren't there's no they're just sort of timeless right that was an interesting um juxtaposition sort of the idea that there's no postmodern cows or pre-cows it's just been cows and they're, they're an important part of life so i thought that was interesting and then, go back. You, sorry go ahead no, the earliest paintings you know the cave paintings you had animals and just all the way through um, we've had cows and all different periods. 
So you're right. And then David's painting that I can relate particularly to the lightning ones because <clears throat> when I'm staying on Lake Superior and there's a big storm, it's a similar thing. You can see the storm way across the lake. Um, and I've painted a few of those scenes and can kind of relate to that. The light that goes on within the clouds and the different layering and the reflection of the lightning flash on the water or the landscape. So I think those are really, uh, really telling paintings, really beautiful. I need to come up there, nail and paint with you because that's a different landscape. Yeah. But that certainly that those those lake effects take a, my my son went to school in Chicago, so we got to visit there. And those I thought a storm would form quickly in West Texas. I've never seen one form that quickly on the lake, uh, at least on it on the, where Chicago is. Looking across the lake. Yeah, they come up fast, and and the big ones are pretty intense too. So. I think that's why there are two or three uh, ships at the bottom of. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that's true. <laughs> yeah, right. Some, some people have not weathered the storm very well. I suspect. No. no. Well, okay, that's that's it for another uh, episode of Inside the Artist Studio. Um, so uh, for the rest of the week, I'm gonna be here in the studio, and I think I'm just gonna sit in front of another some more art. I think that and, works. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, I have no idea who I'm talking to tomorrow because that would mean I'd have to look. Uh, but um, please join us again. And the, the gallery, FYI, if you're in the area, the gallery, all the art, um, we are open from nine to four every day this week, uh, well through Thursday. And then Friday, everything comes down. Uh, for the holiday break. And then it all goes back up on Monday, January 3rd um, in preparation for our opening night gala. Um, there is a mask mandate in Denver. And um, so vax cards and um, masks. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then it's, uh, I know, right? Here they are. Um, and then it, it lifts on Tuesday, much to my dismay, uh, January 4th, but we'll make, we'll do it. We're going to be safe. Uh, I'm actually having masks made up with our logo on it. Oh, so, cool. Yeah, I'm thinking everyone will just want to wear it. I think that's the art. It should be worn. Exactly, sure. exactly. So anyway, thank you for coming and um, hopefully I'll see you again tomorrow. And David, thank you. Well, I'm, it's my pleasure. Neil and Nancy, thank, thank you. you so very much so wonderful to have you in the show and wonderful to hear you talk about your work and hopefully i'll see you in january um if you can make I'll it out there. you'll I'm be glad. there neil yeah. good look forward to neil, seeing you again neil and Nancy. yeah likewise see you yeah to meet you well. take you. care be safe Thank you. happy holidays we'll see some of you see you soon manana bye guys <laughs>